um, I think one of the runners said to me, you know, it's, it's one of the greatest experiences of my life. Some of the best memories of it I've got. And I thought that's wonderful that, you know, you could, you can facilitate that as a producer, you know, you put things together and, and somebody's had that kind of experience. That's, that's the payoff. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on your favourite podcasting platform. Thank you. Today's guests are the Watts brothers, Fionn and Toby, whose directorial debut has been released on VOD and DVD. Playhouse. Jack's not afraid to go to dark places. Well, what's with the paranormal murder inquiry pinned to your wall? I am this close to something great. If we don't know what we're afraid of, then how can we know anything at all? Playhouse is a classic horror thriller set in a Scottish castle. An eccentric writer and his estranged daughter are plagued by a ghost inside the walls, which threatens to destroy their family. Everyone was scared. Yes, they were. Playhouse also happens to be edited by me, and hopefully, I'll have some insight along the way. Welcome to uh, Film Four, and thanks ever so much, guys, for uh, for being being part of this. How are you doing? Doing very well, thanks, Jim. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Good to be here. Good. So, as we record, we're about a month after the film was released on on DVD and VOD. And how are you? How are you feeling right now? Yeah, good. I think um, it's kind of surreal being able to pick your film up off a shelf in the supermarket. Um, we didn't know if the film was going to get a DVD release over here, so that was. That was such a boost, um, and they've, they've done a great job. There we go, with the there design. There we go. Um, and getting into the DVD charts as well, night, we got to number 19 um, for a week or two. Um, so stuff like that is, yeah, it's it just makes it feel like a real movie when you've got the disc in your hand that you didn't make, you know. So, yeah, it's been great. That's fantastic. So I'm going to uh, kind of roll back a little bit and, and talk a bit. I want you to talk a little bit about what your how your filmmaking journey started. So I think we, we grew up, um, you know, we're brothers, you know, we grew up with a sort of creative family. Our mum was an actress and dad was sort of writing stories and various things. And I think uh, at some point he got some kind of Hi8 video camera and we were playing football in the north of Scotland. Um, must have been about sort of 11 years old or something like that kind of age. And he started messing around, you know, shooting things, editing in camera. And um, we started sort of cutting our own little films together. So from going for those small films that you make with your, with your friends, how did you kind of go from there to making a fully fledged feature film? Um, we joined together and formed our production company, Final Film. And for a good six years or so, um, concentrated on making corporate videos and trying to survive doing videos for charities, businesses, stuff in schools with young people. And really what then pushed us into the feature stuff, which was always the intention, was just getting so bored and fed up with the corporate stuff that we thought, come on, we're not getting any younger. I think, yeah, I think we were sort of somewhat powered by boredom and frustration. I think at some point I was sort of like, oh my, oh my God, you know, I'm hitting 30, I've got a bit of grey hair. Um, I really ought to do something to push out of this present reality that I'm in. Well, I think, as, you know, you may have some greys, but at least you've got some hair, so I'm very jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of the start of making Playhouse, why this film in particular and, and how did you kind of get this started? We were just talking about that today, actually, and I, I think a lot of it was driven by the location. And um, we always knew we wanted to film at um, this place that our dad bought in the mid-90s, which is like a, a, a really old tower house, 17th century tower house by the sea uh, on the beach. And we just thought this is great production value is we should obviously make a first film here because it will make it look expensive and so on. You know, that's very interesting that you kind of had the location first and then kind of built your story around it. Because I mm -hmm. think there's a lot of people who have an idea to do like, uh, you know, a big sci fi film, or whatever, but then they struggle because they don't have the resources. But it's interesting that you thought, what resources have I got? Let's build a, a story around that i thought that was quite quite smart of you it was very hard to make sense of why anyone would live there in a film that would be plausible and that's when we started to work out the kind of person that would go there is someone a bit like our dad who was a playwright and likes all that stuff and doesn't mind it being half built up and has these grand visions so the character of jack at the center of the film really was kind of based on our dad 
uh, and, and the whole gothic feeling to Playhouse came out of the locations and candlelight, which we grew up a lot around. It was kind of a world we knew. So I think that it's that kind of practical thinking mm. in terms of producing that was, was, was very helpful to us. You know? and, and I think it's interesting that it might seem quite restrictive to operate like that, but actually we took it to the extreme degree and we were writing scenes around props and features of the building. Um, and it actually gave us creative ideas because we knew that place so well and the feeling. Um, restricting ourselves to that one location actually, you know, opened up doors for us. Yeah. So once you got this script written, um, what was the next stage for you? Um, it was really about approaching a cohort of investors, by which we mean family friends who were in their 60s, 70s, who've got a bit of expendable income, who might put in a few thousand each. Yeah, it was having a sort of hit list, wasn't it? Mm. We thought, well, what, what can we potentially get hold of and how much might certain people put in? And it was sort of like, such as what we put in two, such as four building up the numbers and 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 I, and I think getting getting really organized with a business plan you know a kind of short kind of investment proposal document we did a lot of work making sure that really looked as good as possible so you know, there's a lot of kind of going in faith you know but I think I think we knew the steps uh, and being prepared to do a lot of the stuff that a lot of filmmakers might consider quite boring like legal work um, and you know we, we were prepared to just you know kind of go into admin hell mode and just do everything we could uh, hoping that it would you know, cover our ass, and luckily it did. And that's great because without that, you can't get distribution. So, so um, given that you have uh, that, you obviously started doing corporate videos and working with clients and businesses. How do you feel like, or do you feel like that helped with this process of being professional and presenting yourself? You know, with with a business plan, with uh, a proper setup. A lot of our corporate work was actually working with people who worked in investments and uh, you know venture capital funds and EIS funds and so on and when we would talk to them about what we wanted to do that we would, we would say oh look you know we do make videos like this but we also want to do a feature film we need to raise money they were really interested these people and they thought oh that's really interesting you're not just corporate video guys um, and they would encourage us along the way and I think we gained some confidence from mingling with people who handle millions of pounds and know how to raise money and how to back businesses just chatting with them i think we just got a sense of this is normal a normal thing for people to talk about raising money and risking money spending money i think in terms of making videos and all the rest of it you know it teaches you how to i don't know work, work to a schedule uh, put a schedule together turn up be professional get the shots think on think on the spot mm. uh, think on the spot and all the rest of it but, but i think it's it's like feature, doing feature films like that but to like you know like a hundred thousand times more uh, complex, you know, just because of the nature of the intricacies of story and, um, and and project management and all the rest of it. But, you know, of course, it wasn't all on us. We had a fantastic team and, you know, without having all those really committed people on board, you know, none of it would have happened at all. So absolutely give a good credit to all these fabulous people we worked with, including yourself there, Jim. Well, thank you very much. Oh, that's actually <laughs> the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is how did you go about crewing uh, the film? Yeah, there were a few people that were... Yeah, um, we'd, we'd kind of identified um, from previous working relationships, like we'd worked with our sound recordist, um, our lead actor, we'd already worked with on a few things and uh, and really uh, shaped the role around him a bit. And we'd been talking for a while with uh, our director of photography, Andy Tooby, um, and we managed to wangle a corporate video in the north of Scotland and get him on it to shoot it. So it was a great record for us and a, and a chance to work with him. and. Um, and that was only a few months before the shoot. But yeah, so some were given, we kind of knew people um, and then others were recommendations from the from crew, heads of department. And we would say, look, who, who do you want to bring on Andy? Are they, are they good people? Do you like working with them? Um, and we got some runners from some networking meetings as well. So, so there were some gaps where we didn't have any connections and, and we thought, right, we need to find some people, put out um, crewing calls on groups and check a few references. So quite a mix, yeah. But I think I think you, you know you, you what you can't offer is an awful lot of money. I mean, one thing of course you've got to pay more than minimum you know minimum wage or above. But I think you know you, you say well it's going to be a great experience and everyone's going to get a good good bedroom and many people have en suites and you know we'll put a lot of money into you know put time and energy and money into the food and make sure everyone's taken care of. And I think because and you know the whole idea of a sort of castle has that kind of mysterious sort of draw to it, doesn't mm -hmm. it? 
So I think everybody was really kind of, you know, really up for it. Mm. I mean, I think I came on board it for that reason, really, is, you know, when you showed me some of the photos of the location, it was like, oh, wow, so this is actually going to have some scale to it. And also, obviously, I really like the script and I really like you guys. And so you kind of put the, the money questions to one side and think you, you, there is equity in the experience from my mm-hmm. side of things. I want to meet new people, you know, make a film which you're proud of. And then you kind of, uh, you know, you can go into the into the shops and buy it. That's still a massive thrill for me to be able to go and take it off the shelf and say, I'll have one of these. DVD is still alive, isn't it? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it is. And it's still, there's a sort of magic to that, you know, from when I was little. Uh, maybe kids growing up now, maybe they won't care about it, but it does mean something to me. Um, and so so that's kind of why I kind of came aboard. And I know having spoken to Andy, you know, it was kind of, you know, an, op- an opportunity to kind of um, progress and p- potentially like build a team of people who can move on to the next one or whatever. Mm. And we, you know, we I think we had quite a lot of faith in you guys for doing that. So you touched on it a second ago uh, about the casting. Um, how did that go? And, and what was your sort of thought process in that? Yeah, well, we had so we had a couple of givens, I think, which was our lead actor we'd worked with on a corporate video shoot. Um, Helen, who played Jenny, I was at school with her, and I knew she was a professionally trained actress. She had the local accent. And then the rest of them, it was sort of spotlight auditions. And um, we had a lot of applications, you know, so many people out there who want to be involved with something like that. So you just have to sort of wade through them, shortlist them. And then we decided to run an audition in Sheffield for B. Um, and we thought, well, it's doing Sheffield, not London because we know that they'll be so committed to come up to Sheffield for the audition that we're already onto a good thing. So I think we had 10, 10 kind of, you know, kind of youngish girls come in to play that part. What is that shit in your office? What? This place is haunted. It's so ridiculous. Well, what's with the paranormal murder inquiry pinned to your fucking wall? It's, uh... We just looked at Grace's face afterwards. We recorded it and we thought, well, there's something going on in her face. She's got really interesting eyes and she can act and she took the direction well. Uh, and therefore, we were really quite clear on, you know, she's, she's B. What is all that shit in your office? What, this place is haunted? Don't be ridiculous. Well, what's with the paranormal murder inquiry pinned to your fucking wall? It's- but out of that, we also got the character of Alex. We've got somebody called Ailey as well. Ailey Bothlin is in the film Play Alex. So we got some two for the price of one, which is great. So yeah, some of it's more straightforward and easy and some of it took a lot more work, you know, and there's hundreds of applications to go through. I always think casting's the only thing you can't fix in in a film. You can fix an awful lot of things, but if someone's just not quite right for the role, they're just yeah. nothing you can do about it. So yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, so exactly. tell me, tell me about the shoot. What? Tell me. Um, so you roll up, mon- you know, whatever was it, Monday morning, six o'clock in the morning. Like, how did you feel, kind of stepping onto the first feature film in your careers? It was a strange thing because we were producing and in some ways, you know, um, production managing the the shoot. Um, you know, the night before we were unpacking shopping bags from Tesco into fridges, you know, food for the crew and sort of putting vegan treats in the corner and the milk. And that was what was on our mind. And yet all the time we knew, no, we need to look at the script. We need to get our heads in. We need to direct. So actually that first day of directing was, it was quite difficult to get into it. When we started rolling, you know, we hadn't shot anything with a crew in actually a few years um, because we'd been working so hard to move away from short films, learn how to produce. So even some of the, you know, the commands and things being shouted out on the set, we were kind of like, what is that again? What is that? When do we say action? What happens? It was that level of, you know, fear actually around it. And um, I think after the first day, we, we really found a rhythm as a crew, but there was, yeah, a lot of trepidation um, and, and, and nerves uh, around that. Yeah, I think we were just trying to sort of pretend that we knew what we were doing, you know, because if everybody thinks that, you know, the, the, the commander in chief sort of knows what they're doing, everybody feels okay, but inside we're like, we're seriously going to have to figure this out as we go along. So I um, think that's I a think, lot of life, isn't it? Just pretending you know what you're uh, doing. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think that, it, you know, we got into the groove and, and in, into a good working pattern. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That was really good. Thanks. Did you just say spicy monologue? Spicy monologue. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We had a shot list that was all spelled out, and um, that was invaluable for going into each scene because then you can you look at that and say, what was I thinking when I had all the time in the world looking at this scene? You recall the shots and go, oh yeah, I remember exactly how we're going to do this. And most of the time you have to throw out shots anyway because our first AD would say, look, we haven't got the time. Can you do it more simply? And 
and that means involved changing the blocking as well. So there's a lot of thinking on the feet, but having a plan at least to start with and a vision for the scene was something we'd done for every scene. So it was rare that we were going to scene thinking, I don't know, let's wing it. I think that the, the fact that we had so little time was good in a way because we thought we can't mess about. If we mess about, we're not going to get a film here. So everyone was very, very committed and, you know, working insanely hard. And there wasn't really any, any messing about because we just couldn't afford that, you know. So it forced people to gel really quickly and work you know, very efficiently as a team. That's great. So what were the best and worst moments of, of the filming process? Um, you know, we were, it was a bit claustrophobic at times. Uh, you know, I, I think um, our second AD backed into a tea light candle, coke burst on fire <laughs> to get that off her quick, you know, and uh, put it out. Luckily, she was fine. Um, but, I, you know, those are the elements where you think, you know, yes, you're very committed to the art, but at the same time, you know, you really don't want people to get hurt or... Don't, don't turn into <laughs> a real-life horror film, do you? Exactly, exactly. And yeah. it, when it crosses into into real life horror at that point, you know, you, you, you know, you feel, you can feel very on edge about what you're doing and you, you're aware that people are incredibly tired and, and, you know, need to be careful. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the highlights, um, I'm sure it happened a few times, but one I can remember in particular was where a scene wasn't working. It's when Callum comes around un un unannounced um, and they Jack's telling this kind of story, like a naughty schoolboy, and it wasn't working. And I just noticed in the window a reflection of their performances. Um, and then we had a word with Andy, our DP, and we said, look, could we swing the camera around and just film this part of the scene in the window and, and watch it like that? And for some reason, when we did that and, and the camera was off the actors, they kind of relaxed and the tone of it started to work. And we thought that shot alone has helped one direct the actors quite well, but also given us a, a, an image that made them look like they were encased by one of the window panes they look like naughty little schoolboys, and for me it made the scene work um, and that was just a pure accident from spotting it in the window um, so it's stuff like that's a real joy because then there's a sense of the mood changes in the room with the with the crew and with the actors and you think yeah we're, we're okay the scene you know can stay and yeah so that was great I remember when we put that together in the edit it was interesting because that whole because you did play it kind of normally, but that one particular shot, when you put it in the middle of it, it does, it It kind of makes them kind of conspiratorial. It works really well. So I didn't realise that was a... Um, an it was an, as far yeah. as I can remember, yeah, it was an accident. It was Andy swinging the camera around and he said, oh, you know. No, no, I, I saw it in the window when we were, the camera yeah, was just... Make sure gone. he's got credit. You can't take the credit yeah, away. I'm, I'm going to take credit for that because I, I saw it and I said, let's do it. Like, it looks like a, a frame. It's there. funny, I don't remember it that way. <laughs> I, I, I yeah, remember we, it, speak I, to I Andy. Remember it in my different way. But right. the point was, it was something that was given to us that enabled us to yeah. fix what was we weren't getting anywhere with. And most of the time we didn't have... We, we kind of knew you know, what we wanted. Um, yeah. So you uh, get to the end of the shoot. How do you feel once you've wrapped shooting? Oh, you, like totally euphoric. Mm. Cut. That's a wrap. Yeah! Yeah! It was just an unbelievable feeling of elation, really. Um, mm. we, we, all, we all felt quite out of our heads with how sleep the probably were, but just bought a you know, load, load of drinks for everybody, whatever they wanted. And just there was a fan, there was just a fantastic feeling because I think everybody felt like we'd achieved something amazing against the odds because so many things were like against us. Um, and, and for a lot of people, they hadn't necessarily experienced um, a, fe a feature film before or, or indie filmmaking on that level. Uh, and I think it changed people's lives. I, I think, you know, there was one person involved in it who was in a bit of a dubious relationship with somebody felt quite underconfident. And they, they, you know, after they'd done the film, they went and sacked that relationship off and was like, you know, I'm doing this now. So, you know, I, I'm confident about who I am. Or I said, and I, I love, you know, love hearing stories like that, you know. But I think one of the runners said to me, you know, it's, it's one of the greatest experiences of my life. Some of the best memories of it I've got. And I thought that's wonderful. But, you know, you, could, you can facilitate that as a producer, you know, you put things together and, and somebody's had that kind of experience. That's, that's the payoff. But then there's, all, there's that feeling of, oh my goodness, now we're going to actually have to cut the film. It's not over. It's not over. That was terrifying. That was like, there's a whole load more work involved in here. Uh, you know, so yeah, coming back, coming back to reality, you know. It's funny, isn't it? It's a bit more like a relay race as you get like part way through and then you realize you've got all these sections to keep going so heading into post um how did you feel um how did you feel going into it and what were your kind of thoughts about 
both, I suppose, the editing process, but also the scoring, uh, the grading, the sound design. Talk to me a little bit about that. I don't think we quite prepared ourselves for what it, what a film actually looks like when it's just been thrown together. There's no sound. It's just camera sound. There's no grade, no music or anything. And you think, oh, dear, have we blown, you know, all this money on something that's going to look terrible uh, and be terrible as a film? And I think it's just our own experience as, as directors coming into the feature film, not realising actually, and I think Scorsese says it, if you don't want to th physically throw up when you watch your first cut, something's wrong. Um, that helped, but we heard that obviously a few years too late. Um, <laughs> that, that was certainly one thing going into it, but it was great having you know guys like yourself, Jim, and others who were experienced and wouldn't, wouldn't be phased by getting it. And I guess on one level we were worried, you, you might look at the footage and go, Oh dear, guys, there isn't even a film. I can't even make it work. Yeah, there was that we did have chats, here. didn't we, at some point of like, yeah, can we get a bit of money together to maybe get up there and get a few, you know, a few more shots? Because, you know, you're, you're really worried, like, because you're like, is it, you know, is, I know it's not necessarily the case, but you, you feel like this film's, the first film's going to make or break you. You're either going to go on to do more or, you, or it's just going to fall apart and you're never going to do filmmaking again. But one day you'll sit in the cinema and go, God, that could have been me. Oh dear. Um, so I think there's a lot of pressure on it. But but I, I think you know finally, I mean, I the, the post production stuff, you know, isn't something I'm you know necessarily enjoy so much. Uh, it's it's very fiddly, it's very detailed. But I think we felt we you know we've got a good team here, yourself included. You I think you'd cut six films before or something, and so we we're like. You know, in a sense, it was like a relief that it's not on us. Anyway. I mean, we just need to make sure there's some money to pay your invoices. But it's like, it's over to you. You do something great with it and we'll sort of tell you whether we like it or not and whatever. But it, but, but I think, you know, and that includes with the music and all the rest of it. Uh, and, and actually, as the film was brought to life, it just became more and more exciting to see something that was beyond what we thought we'd done. Like, it was like better than it being in our heads. Um, and that's what you want. The film is, you know, greater than the sum of its parts because mm. you've got all these creative people um, combining the rest of it. And, and so, yeah, so ultimately it was, it was fantastic. I, I think seeing it on the big screen, I think one of the things we did as well, didn't we? We went to the cinema quite a few times, watched it on a big screen, and that was just brilliant. Just sat there with a large cappuccino watching the film, no one else in the cinema. Mm. And we took some photos, remember, of ourselves, you know, outside the, you know, the Odeon and various things. And that was, that was so thrilling because you know at this point you're really getting somewhere with it, you know. And it's interesting what you're saying about like watching your first cut and going, oh my God. I think everybody, like from experience, everybody watches their first cut goes, is this it? Is this what we've done? I can't quite. And, you know, you kind of have to take a slight step back, I think, sometimes and go, well, this is the starting point. You know, we've got an assembly, we've got the film. Now let's kind of mold it. And my kind of job is to obviously practically do that, but also kind of um, interpret what you guys want. Um, uh, even if you're not necessarily able to articulate it exactly how you did it. I thought we worked pretty well together like that. And it's quite mm -hmm. unusual. Like I've not worked with a filmmaking team before. I've only ever worked one-to-one -one with people, but obviously you end up working with producers as well. Uh, but I thought our dynamic worked quite well. Um, mm -hmm. And also just as an editor, I felt like you gave me lots of space to like be creative, but also um, uh, kind of venture my opinions as well, because I think sometimes people first time people particularly get a little bit sensitive and a bit kind of you know they mistake the critique of the film as criticism of themselves as people yeah. um, and i know that's something i had to kind of like overcome yeah. early in my career as being an editor someone saying oh, i don't think that quite that's quite right and you just feel like oh no one loves me it's terrible it is but, a staunch learning curve but i remember yeah. you some of the critics you know kind of feeling completely broken inside then you kind of later on thinking Hang on, it's only it's only just one person's opinion, you yeah. know. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's all these things you have to go through, you know. Yeah. So, so you finished the film. Uh, tell me about the release. What your kind of process was for uh, getting the film out there? One of the things we were doing was sending out um, uh, screener links to sales agents and kind of saying, "Hey, do you want to watch? You know, this this cut of the film, and um, are you interested to take it on?" and the people weren't really getting back to us. They were being kind and nice and saying, yeah, we'll watch it, sounds interesting, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what really helped us was during that time we were submitting to, uh, I think, Fright Fest. I think it was maybe the first place we'd submitted to. We found out we'd been accepted. And suddenly then we had something to go back to the sales agents with and say, 
just so you know, that film we sent you, uh, it's, it's going to be in Fright Fest next year. Straight away, they came back and were like, that's really great. Well done, guys. We'll check it out this week. And it created momentum. Yeah. And that's when we started it's, having it's, serious... It's the, power of the, it's the power of the festival, a decent festival attached to the film. Yeah. You know, it's like... Um, yeah, it's like a food product, isn't it? You know, approved by the kind of food standards agency or whatever, you know, suddenly you can go on the shelves, you know. And and I think that, yeah, that was really important for us to get a response. So, so yeah, I mean, and then once we had the sales agent, it was over to them, really. The process was in there. So we delivered the film, given the paperwork and the digital files. And um, it was then them reporting to us on what was happening at the film markets and what other festivals they might want to put it into. And then announcing to us what deals they'd got with distributors around the world. Brilliant. What's uh, the state of the film kind of worldwide now? So it's been so it's been sold to about I think, seven or eight different countries, isn't it? It's like Germany, Taiwan, Malaysia, Brunei, uh, Australia. Australia, New Zealand, Benelux, uh, and, and South, South America and Russia. So, so I think some of the South American countries is going to have a theatrical release soon, mm. which is great some of the Spanish speaking countries. And then it had that as uh, two week stint in Russia, which was great in the cinemas. So it's done some of these like smaller kind of world sales um, and you know, hopefully more of those to come mm. to get it you know, further out. Um, and in the UK, it's on you know, some of the decent platforms as well. Uh, and the DVD release has been going well. Um, we reached 19 in the DVD chart, which was great. You know, that's like top 20 hits. So that was really exciting. So it's doing, it's doing pretty well. Um, we haven't seen a single dime from it, um, but we you know we plow on and hope we might at some point. Yet, um, we haven't seen it yet. Eventually, they'll back a, <laughs> they'll back a truck up to the garden and just, that's it. That's, that's it. it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so finally, guys, what's next for you? What are your plans for the future? We've got a couple of um, horror feature films in development. Um, one of which we've got a first draft screenplay for. Another one is a bit earlier on in its development. And we're toying with a third idea, which would be very low budget and a bit more experimental. Um, so really, we're trying to get those into shape to be able to send out to some sales agents or distributors and have conversations about um, either pre-sales or just getting a sense of the figures in the marketplace to create some viability around it. And at the same time, we're talking to potential investors and other production companies to see uh, where we could potentially source financing for the film. So. There's a lot of conversations and throwing the ideas around, getting feedback and, and a sense of how to build a plan around making um, one at least one of these next films. So w- watch this space, really. Yeah, that's brilliant. All right, then, guys, well, it's really been really lovely catching up and I've learned quite a lot about uh, the process as well. So that's been in, been really interesting. Thank you so much for <laughs> no worries. Joining at all. It's been a joy. It's been a joy to speak to you again, Jim. Yeah, it's been great to uh, just uh, cathartically kind of relieve ourselves of uh, the, the memories. <laughs> three, th- yes, three years of uh, immense uh, hardship, but with some incredible things in the middle of all of that as well. <laughs> and uh, finally, it's like I say, it's worth it. You know, when you've got the at least this exists now and it's out there. And I've got, I've got three on my shelf up there, so I'm uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no. I keep giving them away, so I'll probably be skint in the process. Exactly. Of being <laughs> Peter for pay Paul. Well, thank you ever so much, guys. It's been lovely talking to you again. No, you're welcome. Thanks a lot. That's great. Cheers, Jim. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on your favorite podcasting platform. Thank you.